In the Horn of Africa, America is stepping up its military operations. It's been launching long-range missions, including sending special forces into hotspots. In its sights are Al-Shabaab in Somalia and Al-Qaeda in Yemen. Attacks by those groups have culminated in the horror of last year's Westgate siege in Nairobi. But now neighboring Djibouti has become a vital US base, a strategic springboard. So you can take off vertically. I've been given rare access to it to find out how America is countering what it calls violent extremism. The real reason why we're here is to neutralize Al-Shabaab in Somalia. But does Washington's formula for confronting terrorism, including its controversial drone program, risk making Djibouti itself a target? These people are very dangerous, the, the Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda elements. Whatever it takes, if we can contain them, okay. If we can get rid of them, it's better. Somalia in the 90s was a country in turmoil, racked by famine and warlords. America and the UN deployed forces to try to resolve the desperate situation, but it ended in disaster. In the Black Hawk Down incident, US helicopters were shot down, 19 US soldiers and hundreds of Somalis were killed. Humiliated, the world's superpower abandoned the Horn of Africa. Our mission from this day forward is to increase our strength, do our job, bring our soldiers out, and bring them home. Fast forward 21 years, and US boots are back on the ground. Not in Mogadishu, but in nearby Djibouti, on this former French base. Even today, there are echoes of Black Hawk Down. Out on the flight line, I met the modern day equivalent the rescue teams on permanent standby to go in and extract downed personnel in trouble. We can do this 24 hours a day to be able to go out in austere environments, whether it be over the water, over land, in the mountains, and uh, you know sometimes in, in denied territory and be able to uh, pick up uh, wherever folks are. Taking off with these men on a training mission gave me a glimpse of just how much this base has expanded in recent years. It's grown to over 4,000 people, including secretive special operations, flight crews, medics, and officers from other countries like Uganda, Spain, Korea, and Japan. They're all part of a huge multinational coalition garrisoned in this tiny Rift Valley Republic. Djibouti is strategically positioned, bordering the Red Sea shipping lanes, the Gulf of Aden, Somalia, and just across the water, Yemen. Little wonder the country has become America's sole permanent military base in Africa. These rescue teams are reservists, based in Florida, They train exhaustively to pick up downed crews on land and in water. Okay, just green power scoot. You're a long way from home here. You're in the Horn of Africa. This is yes. thousands of miles away from the United States. Yes. Why are you here in Djibouti? We're here at, at the request of the combatant commanders uh, to, to provide uh, an insurance policy, if you will, for uh, American and coalition forces that are here. It's, it's a noble mission. It's a lot like uh, being a firefighter. You know, you're, you're, you're waiting for someone else's unfortunate events to happen. Crossing the sprawling base, I could see a lot of new construction underway. The signs are that America is here to stay. 
Inside his headquarters, I went to see the man in charge of U.S. forces. General Wayne Grigsby, you're the commander here. What is the mission of U.S. forces here? Why are you here in Djibouti? The real reason why we're here is to neutralize al-Shabaab in Somalia. That's why I'm sitting, sitting right here so I can assist the other nations to neutralize al-Shabaab in Somalia so it will not um, leave Somalia or threaten a United States interest or our, or our country, the United States, as a whole. Across the border in Somalia, the forces fighting al-Shabaab militants are from the UN-backed African Union, not the Americans. But the US is helping train them to do the fighting. Now, some people would suggest that simply by being here, US boots on the ground so far from home in a predominantly Muslim area, right. that that's quite provocative. OK. Um, again, uh, our presence here, and it's not that big, it is a smaller footprint, is to enable our East African partners, remember, to neutralize that threat. So they can build the defense capability institutions that will allow uh, the neutralization of the violent extremists within East Africa. Djibouti's capital does not feel like a city on the edge of a danger zone. Its markets are peaceful, its people largely accepting of the multinational military presence here. Perhaps not surprising in a country with a small population and a very observant police force. Djibouti stopped being a French colony more than 30 years ago, but you can still see echoes of its colonial past here in the capital, in the patisseries, the boulevards, the cafes, the architecture. But these days, Djibouti feels almost like a garrison town for the whole of East Africa for a lot of international forces. With the consent of the Djibouti government, the French are still here, the Americans are here, the Germans, the Italians, even the Japanese. But unlike in Yemen and Somalia on either side of it, there's no palpable sense of militant Islam or anti-Westernism here, partly because this place is very tightly controlled. I've been coming to Djibouti for more than 20 years, and most Djiboutians I've spoken to have never expressed any resentment against the presence of these forces. If anything, the local economy depends on them. Amidst that local economy, a small beacon of luxury. A well-guarded international hotel playing host that week to a counter-terrorism conference convened by the US State Department. Delegates were flown in from Yemen and Somalia. The US commander was there too. But does Djibouti worry that it could be making itself a target for militants? We feel that really uh, Djibouti is one of the top targets of al-Shabaab in the region. Uh, we have already uh, heard about uh, threats from their leaders saying that they will send hundreds of uh, you know, kamikaze or uh, human bombs to Djibouti. They have stated a, a number of times that they will uh, target Djibouti, but we are taking the necessary measures uh, to at least uh, avoid uh, those kind of terrorist attacks. One of those measures is highly controversial, drones. Djibouti has been letting America launch them from its territory since 2002. They've killed a number of militant leaders, but they've also killed civilians and are deeply unpopular in Yemen. I asked Djibouti's foreign minister if this worried him. These people are very dangerous, the, the al-Shabaab, al-Qaeda elements. So it, uh, whatever it takes, uh, if we can contain them, okay. If we can get rid of them, it's better. Uh, but we don't have to you know, uh, waste time in uh, asking each and every time ourselves if we, sh we should use drones or not. I think we cannot afford that. We really, uh, uh, the time is of a sense. We're really uh, surrounded with that threat. Uh, we are small countries with, uh, you know, lacking those technical capacities. And when the United States and others can provide those capacities, we never, you know, uh, turn down the offer. Also at the conference was a delegation from Yemen 
Its post-Arab Spring government is struggling to contain a resurgent al-Qaeda. So I asked Yemen's deputy interior minister what he thought of the U.S. drone program. In truth, I praise America's efforts in fighting terrorism with us, as well as the rest of the world. Terrorism is a very serious problem. It has come to threaten the world's stability and security. But when drone strikes go wrong, and they sometimes do, they kill innocent people and are completely counterproductive. The drone was circling and fired at the building. As my son was standing outside, he was badly injured and later died. Twelve other people were also killed. I was close to them. They were all civilians. What is euphemistically called collateral damage, the deaths of innocent civilians, has nurtured anti-Western resentment in Yemen and risks winning new recruits for al-Qaeda. This drone strike in Jaa last year was roundly condemned by local human rights groups. But the Yemeni government, just like the Djibouti government, is unequivocal about confronting the al-Qaeda threat. The danger from al-Qaeda towards Yemen is that it targets people above all other things. Killing people has been the sole goal of all operations carried out by them. The commander of U.S. forces here does not run the drone program. It's controlled directly from the U.S., but he still batted away any criticism of it. In any joint task force, in the doctrine of our, of our joint doctrine, we always work very hard to have a capability that allows us to show or allow us to work within that capability of special operations and general purpose force interdependence. And going back to, going back to my mission and uh, in protecting, you know, we're worried about protecting the good people of East Africa and we're, and we're also worried about how do we create this momentum to build stability, to build more capacity to allow um, these people to be able to help us neutralize the violent extremists. And those two capabilities together uh, allow us to do that. The Americans have a special reason to focus on terrorism in this corner of the world. Omar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, a Nigerian recruited by al-Qaeda in Yemen, nearly succeeded in bringing down a U.S. airliner using explosives hidden in his underpants. Three times now, his al-Qaeda trainers have managed to smuggle explosives onto planes. But it is perhaps the threat to the vital shipping lanes that join the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean that's of most concern to the governments of the region. The whole world's trade passes through the Gulf of Aden. It's a very important sea passage. Consequently, many terrorist acts that have taken place in Somalia and Yemen have affected the route of this great navigational passage. There was a need to establish significant joint cooperation in the field of counter-terrorism in this region. Port security is taken extremely seriously by the Americans. They've effectively created an exclusion zone around Djibouti Harbor. Three point stance, three point stance. So it's the US Navy, with local permission, that patrols the approaches and guards US ships in port. Over 20,000 vessels a year pass through the Gulf of Aden, potentially rich pickings for pirates and terrorists. All right, cock it, hold it, lift and check it. The U.S. Navy presence here is both a safeguard and a potential target. Our main threat is the terrorists. Uh, we try and interdict all contacts or interdict all ships coming in, uh, make hail to them as much as necessary, and determine those that are civilian and those that actually have a hostile tent against Americans. But how can you tell? How do you, how do you tell an innocent fisherman from somebody who wants to blow you up? We have what we call seaward continuum of force. It's a posture that we use to determine intent from someone who wants to do bad versus someone who's just not aware of what's going on out there. So we start by our general presence here. We have this craft that says U.S. Navy. We stand in aggressive posture with our armor, our weapons, and things like that. Uh, from there, we go to an actual hail 
where we would actually call that ship via the loud hailer or anything like that to let them know this is an exclusion zone. If a boat still comes towards you and you're suspicious, then what? We would elevate our threat posture. We have flares that we'd shoot across the bow to grab their attention. Um, if they disregard that, then we have weapons that will use warning shots. If it gets to the point where they ignore our warning shots, then we would use deadly force. And you've got plenty of that on this boat? Yes, sir. We are more than willing to stop any threat coming our way. Djibouti may be a sovereign nation since independence from France, but when it comes to port security, the Americans take no chances. The US Navy mount these regular patrols day and night. What they're afraid of is a repeat of the USS Cole in 2000, when an Al-Qaeda suicide bomber came up alongside a warship and blew a hole in the side, killing 17 US sailors. The attack on the USS Cole in Aden Harbor was a massive shock to Washington. This was a billion dollar warship with state-of-the-art defenses, punctured by a man in a boat pretending to sell vegetables. The US Navy stopped calling at Aden Port. But it was the attack on its homeland the next year that convinced the White House to go after its enemies abroad to stay safer at home. We will pursue nations that provide aid or safe haven to terrorism. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. And in the aftermath of 9-11, the Americans returned to the Horn of Africa. Your march in the air. Reopening a former French army camp as their base. Within weeks, I went to Djibouti in 2003 to see what they were up to. The US military wanted us to see all of this. In fact, they've got a specific message for Al-Qaeda. It's that now that the US has a base here in the Horn of Africa, they can call up massive firepower at short notice. But US firepower, however far forward it's projected, can't always keep US missions safe. The attack on the US consulate in Benghazi and Libya, resulting in the death of the US ambassador and others, showed up the vulnerability of US diplomats in unstable countries. 20 waters. One combat shirt. This is the Pentagon's response a new rapid reaction unit trained to protect diplomatic missions One set of ACU pants. to make sure Benghazi doesn't happen again. The men doing their kit checks and final preparations here are from what's called the EARTH, the East Africa Response Force. This is a new US Army unit set up to try and respond at very short notice to crises that flare up throughout the region. They're on just six hours notice to move. Some of these men have just come back from Juba in South Sudan, where they rescued, amongst others, the Norwegian ambassador and a number of civilians. Our primary job is to be able to respond to an embassy crisis where they need additional security forces to allow the, the ambassador of that particular country to maintain her or his post so they can continue to do State Department functions out in uh, their country. So if that Benghazi attack happened now, you'd be able to get your guys there in a matter of hours, yeah? In a matter of hours, either myself or the, our Marine counterparts would should be able to deploy a fairly significant force that would allow an embassy to secure itself, at least until either the situation stabilized or that we were asked to evacuate it by the order of the president. And when it comes to rescuing its people from hotspots, there is yet another tool in the Pentagon's box, the MV-22, the Osprey. So, Colonel, you're in charge of a whole squadron of these planes. What is it? Is this a helicopter or is it a plane? It's a little bit of both. Uh, when the designers were first uh, tasked with building this aircraft, they were, they were told to try to make something that behaved like a bird, and they got pretty close. Um, these nacelles on the end with the gearboxes and the engines in them, uh, they can tilt up and um, come all the way down. So you can take off vertically in this and yes. then fly straight? Yes, and that's the whole magic because when you take off vertically, it means you can take off from a wide number of areas. You can land to a wide number of areas in the dust or in the snow, but then to travel, you have the efficiency and the speed of a turboprop. So that's all the magic. Let's have a look inside. Okay. The Marines are very, very good with, the, uh, with this machine gun. It provides defensive suppressive fires. If anybody's shooting at us, we can shoot back at them, making sure we don't hit any good guys. So this is your office? Yes, it is. It's 
largely software driven. Uh, we can change the software a little bit, changes the way the aircraft flies, and we are able to uh, leverage that to very rapidly make adjustments uh, to some little techniques that we, we pick up over time uh, to give us greater capability. Very, very versatile aircraft, very survivable aircraft, and you don't find yourself in a position where uh, you have something that's gonna knock you out of the sky. It's, it's pretty so when, safe aircraft. When you had ground fire coming up and you were being shot at, what are, you, what are you hearing, like pings of the bullets bouncing off the, off no, the plane? No, it, it, was, it, it was nothing like that, nothing that dramatic. It, was, uh, it wasn't even that terribly effective. We have things on the aircraft that can tell you when somebody's shooting at you, um, and that's all it was, which, which really is more of a, hey, somebody's shooting at us, and there was nothing to it. The MV-22 is a bizarre but efficient airborne taxi. Its job is to deliver the Marines onto the ground they have to perform the actual rescue missions. I asked one of them, Captain Wallen, what he's thinking when that ramp goes down. You get a lot of adrenaline pumped up, but at the same time, as long as you're with the guys that you can trust, you've had enough training, um, kind of take a couple deep breaths and everything will be right. There's always uncertainty on the ground. There's, there's always surprises um, and things you don't plan for when you get on the ground. So it, that type of adrenaline, that, that type of uncertainty, that's, that's what you're really feeling on the ground. Uh, when, especially when the ramp comes down. And yet, across the border in Somalia, Al-Shabaab is still a force to be reckoned with. I put it to the U.S. commander that despite all his resources, all his hardware, the U.S. has not yet eradicated militant extremism in East Africa. In the 11 years since this joint task force was set up, since right. the U.S. set up this task force, let's look at the numbers. Al-Shabaab has struck outside its borders in Kenya, at Westgate, it's set off attacks in Ethiopia, right. it's blown up people in Uganda, you've had Al-Qaeda three times putting explosives on planes, in some cases bound for the United States. It doesn't seem to be stopping terrorism. Again, though, that's why we're here. So our job we must continue to work. I mean, that's the mission I've been given. This is what uh, my country's put me here for, is to continue to work in this method. Could they mount another Westgate attack, do you think? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Not with us sitting right here and the partnership and the teamwork uh, that we're building here with Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, and the, team, and the teammates here working through uh, Amazon, the African mission uh, support to uh, Somalia. But all of those things were in place when Westgate happened and still happen. Yeah, sure. Well, sure, you know, this is a complex environment. I mean, um, there are good days and there are bad days. This is a tough environment to be in. Um, what, what I've learned over 30 years is focus on what you, what you can do. And what I can do is continue to work on our mission. The Americans allowed us to see one more aspect of their mission here. inserting special forces rescue paratroopers onto a drop zone. Trained to land in hostile territory, they're equipped to jump into the sea below. We were told they've been schooled in survival, night navigation, and how to resist interrogation. You're cleared westbound down the track. these men would certainly be a prize catch for Al-Shabaab. But today, they're practicing jumping into the Gulf of Aden. There's one idea right there. After they hit the water, they're located. Got it. Coe's got him inside. And picked up by the US Navy. There we go, I got him. Yeah, they cut lost just a little bit. The Americans are not alone in the skies over Djibouti. Contact check. This is a French helicopter operating from a French aircraft carrier, the Charles de Gaulle, and refueling from this US Air Force tanker. This air to air refueling is just one small part of the huge buildup in US and coalition military operations here in the Horn of Africa. Yeah, man, good run to you. Thanks. So return. Nothing I've seen in the air, on the sea, or on land gives any indication that Washington is pulling back from this region. 
If anything, with its forces withdrawing from Afghanistan, Djibouti is likely to grow in importance. I intend to determine how we can continue to fight terrorism without keeping America on a perpetual wartime footing. Our systematic effort to dismantle terrorist organizations must continue. Choosing peaceful Djibouti as its regional springboard makes strategic sense for Washington. This country hosts the Pentagon's only permanent military base in Africa. But for how much longer can Djibouti stay immune from the violence that has blighted its neighbors?